Well, good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to have you all here to, to attend the, the talk given by Professor Spencer Sherman from Imperial College. He's, He's going, going to, to give, give we have the pleasure to have him okay. here to give the talk uh, about numerical simulations and industry relevant implicit large ad simulations for the flow past automotive and racing cars using spectral HP element methods. And then Professor Spencer Sherwin, he has a first degree. He graduated at Imperial College in Aeronautical Engineering. Then after that, you got your PhD from Princeton University and then came back to Imperial College. And then by coincidence, when I started my postdoc, you were starting at Imperial College more than 20 years ago. Yeah, then it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. And thank you very much, Spencer, for giving this talk. Thank you. Thank the you. floor is yours. I think your, your arithmetic is not so good anymore. 27. That's good, yeah. Sorry, uh, when I used to see people in person, always a challenge now with hybrid. Not, not so simple, I guess. <laughs> uh, so we're saying it was 27 years ago since I met Julio, actually, at this work. Strangely for me, spans maybe nearly 10 or 15 years. Uh, 15 years ago, I started working with McLaren Racing. And then 10 years ago, in 2012, I started a fellowship with them where they uh, spent one day a week visiting them on site and, uh, and they uh, paid for some of my salary. And this is kind of the story that's come out of that, that work. Uh, to give some more recent relevance, there is a paper, that's why I put the date of this. This is a simulation just in last December in Siam Review, which kind of also summarizes the stuff I'll talk about today. So what were we going to cover? Let me, oh, that's hopefully my, oh good. Uh, what I want to cover, I, I'll give you some general background, some of you may already know, of course, uh, 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 Formula One is very popular in Brazil, and that track Formula One is quite popular uh, in Brazil with uh, McLaren Racing, so, so that, that's a good overlap for me. So I'll talk a bit about Formula One and why might we want to use these advanced methods that I'll also introduce in this first bit. Then behind the background, behind the details of trying to make these things work, there's lots of numerics and mathematics and stuff that really we need to make work. And, Depending on timing, I may go through some of these topics, but these are the hidden issues that we have to keep looking over and adjusting and refining to get the kind of simulations that we just saw in that first slide. So that's broadly how I'll take us through this time. So Formula One, hopefully if you follow motorsport, you consider uh, Formula One as kind of the pinnacle of motorsport. So pretty much this year, I've been updating my slides this year, 23 races over five continents, of which one of the races, of course, will be in this country and in the, for this continent, and, and Mexico. I think there are two races this year in South America. Uh, this is a thing that kind of makes me think differently. It's a sport, not a science. Okay, there's a complex set of technical and sporting regulations. What does that mean? One of the uh, more bizarre rules is there's something called a teraflop rule. You can run so much time on the computer, or you can reduce that time and run so much time in the wind tunnels. You've got wind tunnel hours, and you have to balance those two things. And either of them are overly constrained these days. We can do far bigger simulation on modern supercomputers than they're currently allowed to in the racing teams, because this was kind of a cost-cutting type type uh, uh, limitation to make sure things didn't get out of control. Uh, I'll highlight there's some rules uh, that keep changing. They changed the geometry this year. Actually, this is McLaren's uh, car for this year. The front wing design is completely different than it was last year. And one of those elements I'll, I'll touch on in a moment. In the UK, of course, six of the 10 teams of ACE in the UK, pretty much in the West Corridor of London. Uh, and I can't quite work it out. It's about 50 world championships since the 1950s. So there's about 20 missing, of which Ferrari probably have got the ball. Okay, maybe right. I don't know. I, I, I've never asked. Yeah, 16. I checked this morning, so I'm not sure where the missing few are. That's why I put the tilde in there. I kind of had this number. So, of course, in the UK, we've been benefiting a lot recently for Mercedes being based in the UK. They've, they've won most of the championships. Um, uh, and the teams, of course, for, from the UK perspective, there's a lot of engineers and, and it, it generates quite a lot of revenue, which is nice at least to support it. It doesn't necessarily mean they give it to us in universities. They're very savvy about how they distribute their, their money, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. Not a brand recognition, that's what they sell. They don't, don't give us that much uh, direct money. So this is from a few years ago, what a Formula One car might look like. About 15,000 uh, uh, parts, excluding the engine, of course. So not, not maybe as bad as you might, might imagine. 
And here are a few statistics about the cars. It's the middle one that I like from the aerodynamic point of view. So top speed somewhere around uh, 350 kilometers an hour, uh, massive acceleration. Those accelerations naturally lead to a lot of g-force on the drivers. So pretty much about five, G, uh, five g's both in braking and in cornering. We mustn't forget the cornering. That's why the, these drivers have to have very strong necks uh, and be able to support themselves. So this is my favorite fact from this list is the weight of a car about 700 kilograms the aerodynamic performance, the negative lift or the downforce they produce may be equivalent to 1,500 kilograms. So nearly twice, this is the uh, uh, 700 includes the driver plus the fuel, but at 250 kilometers an hour, you generate nearly twice the downforce. So, so what does that mean? That means scale electric modes, the car can come along and be inverted uh, and stick to the ceiling. Right? So that's nothing like the cars that we drive. Of course, we have pretty much no downforce in the stuff we do. But the massive elements, this um, this is why, in a way, it's kind of an aerodynamic sport that they're trying to optimize that and keep that is much of a challenge. Um, if you like the engine side, there's certainly engines that, that change uh, uh, an awful lot of times in the races, and pretty much they, they run these cars at 70 or 80 percent of their peak performance throughout the race. So why might we want to use fancy numerical methods on the, the sort of uh, uh, design to get this aerodynamic performance? Pretty much this is the fact I like. The competitive differentiation in milliseconds is about 2% performance gap between being first and being 10th, and 0.3 performance gap between being first and being third. So a small difference can make a big impact, at least on your places in the races. The last maybe seven, eight years, engines have also had quite a lot of impact on the races, but, but we have this, this role of the aerodynamics that comes to play. So what, what do they like to do with the aerodynamic performance? Well, here's a kind of illustration of a front wing from a few, few years ago. Of course, they have open wheels that generates a lot of turbulence and noisy, dirty air. And they try to use a lot of these control surfaces to either throw the dirty air out sideways or get, get uh, extra aerodynamic performance in terms of downforce. Um, one of the rule changes that happened this year is to throw away all of these devices because it was stopping overtaking. It pushed out so much dirty air to the side that when, when you overtake or if you're behind, it became very difficult. One of the motivations to make it a lot cleaner so that the teams can't play with that, that aspect so much. And indeed, this year, they've seen a lot more overtaking. Uh, a rule that I've used in this talk for many years, but now I'm going to have to stop uh, it soon because they've taken it away, was this. This example of something called a Y250 vortex. So I don't know, maybe maybe 10 years ago, the cars were going too fast. So what the, the governing body said is, we'll design, we, we will allow you to fix this bit of geometry, and you can design this bit on the outboard aspect. Uh, and in doing so, then they chop the uh, these front wing elements off at 250 millimeters from the center line. So that's why they call it a Y250 vortex. Um, so what happened in that first year's race, so I should use the pointer here, um, so, so whenever you have a, a wing tip, you must generate a, a, a vortex at the end, it's very natural, so that you generate this vortex. And by the end of that season, they've worked out how to take this vortex, make it run nearly four meters uh, along the length of the car, and almost act like a virtual skirt on the side and increase the down, down performance from, from tweaking where it goes. But it highlights the problem of taking something that's quite a small aerodynamic uh, shape and, and trying to model it for this length. And there's no way that's uh, an accurate uh, representation of the aerodynamics in that case. So that's this 2% performance that's hidden in this kind of design problem. Oh yeah, I put that in there to remind me the, the front wings, if you go and watch the race, uh, I think it might be another one this weekend, they don't have the, these kind of gaps in them anymore. It's not chopped off anymore, it goes all the way through. And ironically, that's what the uh, front wings used to look like. I'll show you some, some results later on about that. So, uh, turbulence, have you know a bit about turbulence? We've got different kind of flow regimes. Uh, I think if I push this, uh, I normally express the idea of speed in Reynolds numbers. This is this image here in the corner is the uh, is Reynolds. He was the first professor of engineering in the UK. He was based in Manchester, actually. He was the first ever professor we had in engineering. To give you some idea of what it means, a uh, Reynolds number of 1,000, it's broadly the flow rate in your, your A to Garch, the mean flow. Um, maybe birds uh, the order of 10,000 to 100,000. Where we'd like to be is about uh, millions. When we talk about automotive simulations, typically much the characteristic Reynolds number is millions. Of course, things get higher. If you talk about the aeronautics industry, you can well get up into the tens or hundreds of millions. So what can we actually simulate uh, um, if we want to go through this Reynolds number regime? 
The hand wavy argument goes as the following. The, the amount of floating point operations, the flops that you do on a computer, compared to the Reynolds number, it scales broadly as a Reynolds number cubed. So as a datum point a few years ago, let's say we could model all of the turbulence and the flow scales as something like a, a bird, somewhere of the order of 10 or 20,000 Reynolds number. And if we're able to get this sort of speed up, then what would that mean? So, uh, sorry, I haven't said the speed up. The speed up historically used to be based on Moore's law. It used to be when we had our Intel processors, you wait uh, 18 months and then it doubled in speeds purely from flops. So, so we use that argument to say every 18 months we get doubling in speed. That takes us roughly today from this being able to simulate everything. So if I want to get in the million number of regimes, it takes me about 2040. So that's well, what are we at? That's getting on. If I if I retire quite late as the academics, that's my retirement age. But this is a little bit optimistic. If we can't get that speed nowadays, we have a lot of troubles getting this kind of performance out of computers. Let's say it takes us three years to get that doubling in speed. And if you're into this sort of stuff, memory movement on, on modern architectures using GPUs, there's a lot of challenges about what we do with our memory bandwidth and memory movement. So that takes us to get into the million number of regime and simulate everything to 2070, which is maybe some of the younger people in the audience here's retirement age. So that's, that's the window we're working in. Fortunately, we don't need to solve every scale of the problem. So we need to get better, which is what we're trying to move up, but maybe we don't need to have every single sort of uh, eddy of, the, of that flow in our simulations. So the, the workhorse tool used by most uh, uh, Formula One teams uh, historically has been using Reynolds average, now there's Stokes. So, so this is where we take a kind of a very average view of the turbulence. In this case, what have we got? Let me see if I get my, oh, I don't know what I've done there. Let's see if I get my pointer back up. Here we go. Um, so this is this Y250 vortex, the, the geometry is being chopped off here, and it creates this vortex. And you can see how big and blobby it is. It's a great big circular, big blue thing. Um, what these uh, red and blue blobs represent are the turbulence on the surface of the, 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 the um, geometry there, and it feeds in and creates this vortex. So that's the first attempt at making the, the physics of this problem. So if you want to get a bit more performance out of it, one of the features you do, so that was a time average flow, is to move something called detached eddy simulation. So in this case, what you're doing is you're adding unsteadiness back into the flow. And if you put the unsteadiness in, then you can see more or less in this image that the vortex here, it's a bit sort of uh, smeared, I'm afraid, but it looks a bit more spirally, right? The real vortex isn't just being blobbly and circular. It tends to spiral around the center. So, so we can see we've got some slightly better physics there. But the blobs on the surface are still great big red and blue blobs to represent the turbulence. So if I want to go one step further, if I want that 0.3% performance, what I've got to go and do is put even more physics back in, which is where we try to come into it and do something like this. So it's an implicit large eddy simulation or under-resolved DNS. And, and, and the headache is we need to put all of these structures in on the surface. This is kind of under-representation of the turbulence that actually happens on these control surfaces. There's lots of small eddies that are in the boundary layers. They come along and they feed into that vortex and then that then dictates its strength and move forward. So that's the big step that they're looking to, to, to go over. And it's mainly these high-end industries. We also work with Rolls-Royce. It's another example of somebody that needs to get to those fine margins uh, to improve their engineering. Uh, and, and if there wasn't a teraflop rule, we'd be able to do more of this in F1. But pretty much at the moment, <laughs> when I started 10 years ago, they said, we're going to try and change the rules, and we'll see if that, that, that would open everything up. The problem about changing rules in F1 is everyone has to agree. It's now being brought out. But you know, if you're winning, you don't change the rules, right? You fight as hard as you can to keep all the rules the same, and if you're not doing so well, you want the rules changed, and eventually something happens. So that's that's the politics, not the science that goes on. So what do I do? Well, how do we, we, we offer some advancements in the methodologies to go through this? We use these spectral HP element methods. So what's a spectral HP element method? Here's, we, we've got classic finite difference methods, and when I'm referring to HP, H, like in the finite difference method, means you know, the separation for a grid and the size of the mesh spacing. So another classic method is a pure spectral method. So I have to be careful. I'm referring to spectral elements, but there's a classic method using Fourier methods, spectral methods, which if, if I didn't have any geometry in my flow, then my, my pointer, we'd have a periodic box here, no geometry. And what I could do is I could represent my solution as a series of Fourier modes. So I have a a fundamental mode, one sine waves, two sine waves, and going up higher and higher. And so my use of P here 
it's going to be a polynomial mode, you can think of it like a mini Fourier mode that you're aware of here. So I've got hopefully two types of discretization. I can use mesh spacing, or I can use something similar to the idea of spectral methods and having nodes that have this hierarchy of information. Uh, in terms of engineering, the most common tools that we might come across are finite elements or finite volume methods. And they're generally still very much based on the idea is you make a mesh, the difference between a finite difference and a finite volume or finite element method is you can typically deal with complex geometry much more easily, but you still resolve things by using edge, by making the mesh finer and finer. So what we do is we blend these two ideas. We take the idea of a complex geometry domain, the H resolution, and then add the idea of this spectral method to make a spectral HP element method or HP method. And here's my, my example of that. So it's a bit faint here. I've got a representation of the British Isles. That's me discretizing it uh, uh, in terms of triangular elements, the H type discretization. But then within each one of these triangles, I've got something like a triangular Fourier mode, if you want, expansion. So you should really think of these as adding on top of each other. This mode, this mode, and that mode, they're the linear varying functions that you would get in a classic linear finite element or a finite volume. Then on top of that, what are we doing? You're adding something that looks like a quadratic shape along the edge and then cubic and then quintic. So this is a fourth order polynomial expansion that you use in each of these cells. Ah, any good area has lots of terminology to make it confusing. It's kind of what we're good at as academics. So uh, the community I came from originally, we refer to them as spectral element methods. That was the fluids community. At the same time, there's a big fine structural mechanics finite element community, and they refer to exactly the same methods as HP finite element methods. Unfortunately for me, I, I was involved in trying to make triangular versions of this. We designed this expansion or, or modified it, and it looked much more like the structural mechanics and the fluid mechanics version. So we combined all the names together, and that's why we call it spectral HP element methods. Uh, out there, and I've had some presentations already here, the classic approach to finite elements I would refer to as continuous Galerkin or continuous Bouzgnock Galerkin. Since then, another technique's come along called discontinuous lurking. I know some people are already using that here. There's uh, uh, some interest by Tony Jameson, who's one of the father figures of finite volume methods, and he's got involved in the technique, and they call their variants with, with a former student of mine, flux reconstruction. So if you go and look at the literature at the moment, there's all sorts of names, but pretty much we all come from this sort of class of discretizing our problems with this H and P. How you bolt these things together then means we have a change in those names there. So why do we do it? Why might it get us to this solution of the, these extra few percentage uh, uh, um, accuracy? So broadly, the argument goes the cost of these methods scales like how many elements times this polynomial order raised to the fourth in 3D. But the error, the potential reduction in error, scales much more exponentially. It scales at the size of the elements to the raise to the power of p. So there's a sweet point as I increase this polynomial order that I'm going to get much, much more accuracy uh, as I increase that P. And over the years, I've struggled to motivate that, but this is the one slide that I've got to try and demonstrate it. But let's just take a cone, one of those small vortices, and I want to propagate it for many, many wavelengths like that vortex all the way along the Formula One car. And so if I go around in a circle, I should remain like this cone. So if I compare that, this is a, a P equals one. It's actually, it counts as a second order discontinuous Galerkin approximation to this cone propagation problem. And you can see within one revolution how quickly the numeric smears out that vortex. So that's our challenge to remove that, that steering effect. So what happens if I blend this? I can take here just 32 elements times a P equals three, a fourth order would be poly, third order polynomials, fourth order accurate, or a P equals eight, an eighth or ninth order accurate simulation, but, but coarser and coarser meshes. And what you can see is as long as you can capture the shape in the cone. So even in this case, it's getting a bit coarse, but the cone is about the size of one of those elements. So you must have that feature. And then P can be very powerful. At least this cone and this cone look like I've still got something. I've got fewer degrees of freedom here. The, the computational cost is a bit of a trickier argument. I've actually got 384 versus 288. And I can have something that looks like the original shape that I wanted. So if I can harness this sort of power, we get more accuracy for a, a reasonable, well, it's still, still quite a heavy cost. Don't, don't get the impression I can present an argument we get better accuracy and therefore get the highly accurate answer quicker, but it's still expensive. If it can't, it's not, you know, we're, I, we're not replacing RANDs. If you just want to run something on your desktop, you should definitely use a RAND solver. If you then need it to be really accurate and move forward, that's when these sort of methods come into play. 
Okay, so uh, so we have this this uh, software tool. These things get very complicated to implement. So we thought uh, maybe in two thousand and five we went to our uh, Nectar Plus Plus distribution. We should write the tools, make them open software, and get other people to use them and carry on developing them. Uh, and already in the time of this visit, we've had some chats on different topics. We can there's things like stability analysis. These top three images represent incompressible flows. Historically, I've done uh, some work in biomedical flows. And the bottom images actually represent things closer to uh, compressible flows. There's a compressible flow of a, sil uh, a cylinder. I like this one. This is, uh, this is, these are the Euler equations. This is a pulse wave in the blood flow. When your heart beats, it pushes blood into your cardiovascular system, which is elastic, and it sends waves up and down the cardiovascular system that bounce backwards and forwards and create different flow patterns in different vessels. So Euler that we know from the Euler equations well, he didn't write, he wasn't thinking about gas dynamics. When he, he wrote his original equations, he wrote them down for this problem. Okay, so this is, this is, this is the original Euler equations is this, and then of course we, we, we use it for all sorts of applications from ever since. Okay, so that's the pretty picture part of what we can achieve, but what's all the headache behind doing all this stuff? And these are kind of three of the problems. Essentially, meshing, meshing is always a headache, so I want to admit what the, the differences are for us in higher order methods. And these last two things are to do with stabilizing the flow and making it robust, particularly when we try to simulate at these high Reynolds numbers. So let's have a little look at this. This is, I, I'm the kind of the junior partner in the meshing side. It's really uh, my colleague who's another professor at Imperial Park in Hero. We have, uh, uh, oh, he was a, a, a postdoc researcher, but now he's a reader in King's University, Dave Moxie, and particularly this uh, PhD student of ours and Mike Turner that helped help push this stuff forward. So what, what are the differences for these higher order methods in meshing? So if you have a mesh, you have, you have a CAD representation, some sort of boundary representation. What you would normally expect to do then is you, you might make your linear finite element mesh. And what it does is it takes all these nice cur curvy linear surfaces and tends to make things faceted. I mean, by, by design, these methods have linear representations and you get a linear representation of the geometry. So, so we start from that starting point. But because we're using a high order method, we don't have to live with this faceted world of geometry. We can use that high order expansion to go away and, and make things curvy linear again. So on the outside of this little gingerbread man's arm, you can see it's curved again. The smiley face is also being curved again. So when these geometric properties are important and you want to represent it, we have that additional power to get to that. So that's the positive side. What's the headache side? Well. Uh, the headache side is well, what happens when you deform things, do you make sure stuff is valid? So critical part is the ability to capture the geometric complexity, that's good. Good quality meshes, we still need, if you don't make a, a valid mesh, it doesn't matter, you don't, can't simulate anything, everything will just blow up when we get on the computer. And so this is broadly our problem. When we have a curvy linear surface, we might fit a triangle to it, which is our linear finite element discretization. Now if we didn't have to curve it, it would just fix some sort of points over the element that represents that p-type polynomial expansion. But then these elements wouldn't be actually lying on the surface. So what we want to do is push those things forward and make it curvy linear. So oh, then Moxie gave me the slide that goes over there. And then you could say we just push those points up and hopefully we'll get something that looks like this. Now, that's all well and good, but this is a nice big shape. They didn't have any problem moving these surfaces. What happens if I'd been even more curved on this shape and my, my geometry pushed it right up as far as those uh, first yet uh, orange green dots? Then, then the whole uh, mapping would become uh, ill-posed, not very well-posed. So I think I've got a little example of that afterwards. So let's see, curving and emission often leads to invalid elements, which is where high-order mesh generation people spend most of their life fixing those problems. And I think just to motivate that, I've got this example here. So if I have this sort of flower-shaped geometry, and I've got this element. Now, in this case, I've got a, a thin discretization near the surface. If I want to capture those boundary layers, that's often what I need to do, is have really fine meshes near the surface of the geometry. But in this case, where it's kind of concave, as we look at it from the outside, this is what would happen to the element if I just naively push it forward. Okay, and then, and then the, it doesn't matter. You can, <laughs> this isn't going to run. You're just stuck, and you, you can't do any simulations. So. For Dave and for, for, for Joaquin, they play in this area too. There's all sorts of PDE solver problems you can solve simply for the meshing. So you can play around with that, and these are the more advanced techniques. But the one that's kind of unlocked our ability to do any simulations 
has been the following trick, or trick observation, which okay, we, we, we came up with, I guess, in 2014, 2015. If you allow yourself to make a very core sesh, uh, so here we had a very big prismatic element, so that when I do that initial deformation, it doesn't self-intersect, it's kind of valid. What that means is, at least from the uh, mesh generator, I have a representation from how we think of discretizing our problems, which is usually in this parametric space where everything is linear. We then know a mapping, and that's this, it's part of this polynomial expansion that takes us from this rectilinear, uh, easy to deal with space up to this, this deformed geometry. Now, strangely, <laughs> when we tried to do mesh generation for the decade before, what we kept being obsessed with is if I want to make a a mesh in the surface, I need to somehow put a, a small point very close to here and make another thin element. Now, now uh, boundary layers are, are millimeters, if not sub-millimeters thick, and then it's really easy to mark up where you put this point and everything will become self-intersecting. This paper, <laughs> the observation we made in this paper, which is kind of trivial afterwards, is, well, let's not think about doing stuff in the real <coughs> physical space. Everything gets really well behaved in our parametric space. So if I go and slice, I can make as thin as elements as I like in parametric space. And then because I knew how to map the macro element up, I then know how to map every one of those slices up without making anything invalid. So, so this, <laughs> this trip, seemingly trivial observation, but at least nobody else had thought of it before Joaquin kind of came up with it, has unlocked our ability to make, to, to, to make these more challenging meshes, where honestly we're not really refining very well in the... Uh, um, tangential direction, but we are capturing the flow physics in the wall normal direction, which is kind of the most important direction if you have to make a choice that you want to capture first, and then, you know, if we can afford it, we'll make the, the meshes fine as we go through. So this is an application to an earlier geometry that uh, Karen actually called the Imperial Front Wing. We had two PhDs a long time ago, and then they gave us this geometry, and then they branded up uh, after our name. So here's the initial geometry. Is my, my coarse linear finer element mesh is this big blue region, and then I'm going to split them into finer and finer layers. And if I think I click this button, if I zoom down, here's my boundary layer resolution, I zoom all the way in. In this case, I've only got three slices. We typically might use six within one of those discretizations. Now, if you use finer element or finer volume, these meshes will look really coarse to you, but you have to keep remembering that within each of those cells, I'm also applying a polynomial order. So you can think of it of subdivided by this factor of P, and that's the density of mesh that we've truly got behind it. So that's pretty much what we do for the, the, these more complex cases, and, and that allows us to get some sort of topology. So, all well and good. Is that the end of the story? No, there's, there's two other headaches or there's, there's, uh, that we have to deal with that allows us at least to try and get these big simulations. Now, um, I kind of I enjoy showing this image, but I realize it doesn't mean anything to the young people anymore. Oh, it's not even going to play this movie. So, so, so when, when, when Julie and I were kids and we watched on Catholic Array Tunes and we watched Westerns and they had wagon wheels and they used to go around in circles and the aliasing, the frame rate of the TV made the wagon wheels go backwards. So that's, that's a, a visual interpretation of aliasing. Of course, we have Nyquist high frequency coupling. Well, it happens in these methods, in Fourier methods and when we use these polynomial techniques. Uh, so what is this kind of a nice example from... Uh, Close colleague, well, my supervisor and uh, another one of his students that I work with a lot. If I took a tenth order polynomial expansion, and I might need, when we solve the Navier Stokes equations, we have in the incompressible flow quadratic nonlinearity. So let's take this function, which is a tenth order polynomial expansion, and I'll square it. And I want to say, how well can I represent or integrate the square of that function depending on my, my integration rule, my quadrature rules? Now, when you first design these methods, you design them for linear problems. And if you have a linear problem, you would only need 12 quadrature points to integrate a linear operator, just to integrate u times, times a, a, another function. But when you have a quadratic function, you actually would need 17 points to integrate it exactly. So does that make a difference whether I use 12 or 17 points? But this image on the, the right-hand side shows it. So the, the actual solution is this light curve here. And if I subsample it at 12 points, which is what the, the dots represent here, you very naturally see this, this sine wave come out of that subsampling. And so what that's telling me is I take this very high frequency data, I undersample it, and it seems to give you energy in the low frequencies. This is this is a this is aliasing, and this is a mathematical phenomenon which could be dealt with with exact integration. And the red bars here represent the extra energy in this case that's been added to the flow if I if I am naive about my integration. 
So I have to go and be accurate about the integration. And if I do that, then I see things improve. I'll uh, show a, a few, an example of that in a moment. But there are actually three sources of, of uh, aliasing that we might worry about in these techniques. One would be something dealing purely with the PD, we call it PD nonlinearity of the convective terms, that are something that's like the U squared operator. There's also geometric aliasing. We just talked about this meshing where we have these curvy linear meshes. What that means is there's a, a mapping factor, a mapping which is another polynomial in these integrations. So if I have a very deformed element like this, then this is also allowing the geometry to cause an aliasing of this nature. So I have to add even more quadrilateral points if it's very, very deformed. And um, a less well-recognized case is if you do these discontinuous Galerkin methods, for those of you who have studied that, in that case, you solve something called a Riemann problem. And it says that this interface between two elements, some, if the flow is going forward in half the element and backwards in the other element, you, you aim this information. You take information from one side, which is incompatible from the other side, and block it together, and you can also get this type of form. This, this isn't really relevant to the stuff I'm showing you today, but it's just another mechanism of this sort. So does it, does it, does it cause a headache in reality? So when I was starting in that time with McLaren, they gave me this problem, I'll, I'll hopefully explain it a bit more in a moment, of a, a front wing geometry, uh, and they, I eventually got to simulate it, but I could originally only go up to about 500,000, here, here we got up to 1.2 million. So if I take this simulation and I calculate the nonlinear terms and then I integrate them using a low quadrature rule compared to a high quadrature rule, this is the energy that that, that kind of under-resolved simulation can generate. So here's a 30% level of energy be coupled back onto the problem. And then if I zoom in again in these two small places, I get up to nearly 200. These, there's a really thin mesh near the surface which is required to get those boundary layers. And I've got order of 200 times aliasing back of the energy. And then everything blows up again. That's the, <laughs> the story I've been, I've been studying these methods for a long time. And when we used it for um, direct numerical simulation when we could resolve things, then it was fine. We just threw accuracy at it and everything worked. It's this whole issue of trying to push it into this industrial framework where everything is under-resolved that's brought to light all these challenges. Now, previously I would have said, well, that's fine, that just tells you you need more resolution, but we can't afford to give you more resolution. So conversely, we have to work hard in identifying what they are, try to make the methods robust, and then if they're inaccurate, you can still see a solution that may not be good, but then you can look to refine it. So that's the kind of the reverse philosophy of, of having to do this. So, all well and good, in that time in McLaren, I went away, we managed to make meshes with boundary layers, we managed to DA this, and I think we were nearly getting up there, we got up to 500,000 versus the 1.2 million, and, and, and then this happened off the body, this, 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 okay. the stuff just blew up where I had a mesh expansion. So my, my headache, the final headache of why we need some smoothing is why, why does that problem happen in these cases? So I would broadly say there are kind of two things we worry about. We worry about wave interaction, which is this aliasing problem we've just been discussing. So we have one frequency and you multiply it together, it makes a high frequency, it needs to couple back onto itself. And there's another one that happens, which is mesh expansion. So if I have a, a mesh expansion, what we observe is the flow comes in, I gamma hits a mesh expansion, and although in reality the, the wave should just carry forwards, what a mesh expansion can do, it's like having two materials almost uh, in the properties. You get a, a reflection back and a transmission wave. And pretty much when it boils down to, that's what's happening when I got these off-body blowing up regions that there's a bit of a mesh expansion. Waves are numerically getting trapped. So not, not, not strictly speaking, a missing problem. It could be there in even a linear problem when you have a mesh expansion. And so we had to deal with this last part. And when you've got nothing else left, what you do is you get a big hammer, a smoother, and you hit it with some smoothing. So this is the, the last part of the puzzle. And, and uh, indeed, it's involved some, some work with Rodrigo Mora, who, who was, uh, came and did his PhD with me, but is at ITA now. So we want a slightly smart diffuser, right? If we just take an ordinary diffusion operator, then that would kill off the flow at the low frequencies. And then what's the point of having all this high accuracy stuff? Then we just might as well use a low order method. So this, this spectral vanishing viscosity idea, which is introduced by uh, Tabor, Medai, and Koba, it says, if I'm a bit smarter about I have a, I have a specialized kernel, if this, this was just a one in here, this would be a standard diffusion operator. But I've got a, a kernel operator, which in frequency space, in Fourier space, says let's damp high frequencies and leave low frequencies untouched. 
then I can have something that's favorable about these properties of the P methods. In this case, we tune the, the kernel to get rid of this high spike, but to leave that low sinusoidal method untouched. Now, I might not, this is a series of Rodriguez papers, it's done quite a lot, I've got, uh, I haven't got five papers worth of slides here, believe me, but some paraphrasing, but I might, might choose just to go through this uh, a little bit more straightforwardly, but since we don't have so much time. Ah, uh, let's see, so, I don't know, if you've ever studied numerical methods, there's something called von Neumann analysis, uh, and essentially, if you take something as simple as a linear advection diffusion problem, you can ask, you can analytically find out how waves propagate. Do they, in this problem, they should propagate to the right and then they should diffuse at a certain rate. And then we can compare that to how quickly the numerical methods propagate. So in my cone problem, I had a diffusion and dispersion characteristics. There were two types of stability analysis. The first one that we, I teach as an undergraduate, and I suspect you've been taught, is when you take a wave which has got a wavelength k, and you feed it into this as a so-called dispersion or eigenvalue problem, and you get back from that an omega, which tells you how quickly things disperse or diffuse. So that's that's the classic case, and we can still do that for our, our, our high order spectral methods, and then we get, what well, explain, we get the, the, these curves like that. But this is the one that's more relevant to the, the, the um, reflection problem. It seems strangely counterintuitive initially. The, the, the so-called spatial eigenvalue problem says, let's imagine in my, in my mathematical space, I can inject a frequency magically in the middle of the, the wave, and it's got some a temporal wave number omega. And what would happen from that? Well, if I feed it in this problem, k is quadratic here, so it's got two solutions. And what you get out of that is that you have waves that both propagate to the right and propagate to the left. So it's got a little gradient that we want. And what we're going to say is that's like our idea that we have a fine mesh. So how do we get this sudden injection of stuff at an interface? If I have a really refined mesh going to a less refined mesh, the way it comes to the right, it propagates. When it hits there, it's like I'm injecting that omega. And then I get a transmitted wave, which is quite large, but I also get this reflection. And it's that reflection, which is nothing to do with the, the, the analytic solution here. It's the numerics that get involved. So by looking at this problem, you can, we, you can find all the eigenvalues. The blue lines here represent the good stuff that's moving forward. The red lines, stuff that get reflected back. And this line here is interesting because it has very, very low diffusion and therefore stays there and mucks up our simulation and causes these, these kind of problems. So uh, I'm going to skip over. This is really just motivating that it's real, though we can simulate it so that it doesn't just completely artificial. But what did Rodrigo do? So we spent a lot of time playing with different kernels in those papers. The one that we use at the moment that we like the most is we try to match the, 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 the continuous Galerkin methods that we're using here with, in fact, discontinuous Galerkin methods naturally have very good properties in this diffusion dispersion, even in the spatial eigenvalues. So we try to match our, our method to DG curves. Don't worry about too much of this stuff. It's a bit annoying because we lose two orders of accuracy it would seem in terms of how we match our continuous Galerkin to the discontinuous Galerkin. But what we ensured in the spatial eigenvalue is those waves that propagate back always had some diffusion, quite a heavy diffusion. So they get reflected, we can't stop that, but then they die out quickly and then they stop our, the overall problem blowing up. That's our kind of philosophy from, from doing this approach. So that's that's the thing that, that uh, well, I didn't used to admit so much about the factor of two, but now we've got a solution to that factor of two. So I, I, I would, <laughs> this is some work by a guy called Eric Berman, and I've just got a schematic. So it's something called we're, we're calling gradient jump penalization. Broadly, the idea is if I have a finer element linear method, if it's under resolved, then I get kinks at the element interfaces. The solution itself isn't, well, the, the solution is continuous, but the jumps of the solution are not continuous. If you penalize that jump just at the interface, it appears that you get the same sort of properties that we had about this um, spectral vanishing viscosity. You can take the cone propagating here, and this is what it would look like if we didn't have any stabilization. If we penalize these interface, you get a nice smooth looking feature here. And I wouldn't have thought that, 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 you know, I wouldn't have made the connection. This is thanks to Rodrigo working with Eric Berman, but when he compared this, um, if you like, stabilization technique with this eigenvalue analysis, we found it had really good properties, even better than the ones that we managed to design with the SVV. So we've only just finished playing with this and we're starting to 
to, to use it a bit. Um, if you know any of this literature, really I should credit the idea of something called continuous interior penalty uh, suggested by Douglas and DuPont way back in 76, except that I hadn't got a clue what continuous interior penalty meant. It's, that's why I like using gradient jump penalty because I, I penalize the jump in the gradients. That's what we're doing and, and how we use it. Okay, uh, so there's lots of parameters that we do. Let's not worry about that too much in the interest of time, but let's at least show you if I compare using that spectral vanishing viscosity with this gradient jump penalization, this is a uh, flow past a cylinder at a 3900 that's been studied quite widely. Um, so what have we got? The, the blue line, the dotted line here, which is very draggedy, is polynomial order three using our, our favorite SVV DG kernel. And the um, solid orange lines which are lying on top of each other are polynomial three and five of using this gradient jump penalization. And the black line is the thing we're trying to mask. You see, we're almost nailing it with the gradient jump penalization, but we have to go up to fifth order with this spectral vanishing viscosity to get the same solution. And this is also a bit, and these are just these are profiles in the wake. Here we're getting this kind of square shaped wake, whereas initially with the spectral vanishing viscosity in that factor of two, it's, it's too kind of curvy and you know, rounded. So, so, so we get back. You, you have to use smaller time steps because it's not getting rid of so much energy, but you get back a lot more accuracy from using this method. Right, so if you get someone that show you some applications, then we better wrap up. Uh, so this is an experiment uh, that was originally done by um, uh, some guys at Stanford, uh, and that's why it got a lot of interest. They they able to get uh, pressure distribution in the experiment, both near the wing tip. And when I mentioned that, that Y250 vortex, they had some, some data in, in the vortex that came off. So this is why McLaren were always interested. This is an example is, can we simulate this case? So actual fact, the real experiment, I think, is at uh, 4 million. We only got up to 1 million in this case. But So quite pleasing. It's slightly inboard. You can see we get really good agreement with the circles of the experiments. Uh, but a little bit outboard, there's something going on that we're not quite matching the wing tip. At some point, we can blame the experiments not being, you know, what, what conditions are there, we don't know. There were, there are geometry, we could change our geometries in the setup and accuracy, and we can start blaming the experiments too, but we can't say we got that perfectly well. The front side is in town. Uh, the thing that we're, McLaren were interested to show was, was this sort of result. So this is the speed from the trailing edge, this is the sort of trailing edge location, this is the axial speed in the center of the vortex that has this, uh, this quite strong increase and then plateaus. So the, the problem for them, if they use something like a k-epsilon model, it's very diffusive in nature, and, and then you get this, you know, you kill the vortex off too quickly. Okay, and then you can spend orders of magnitude in compute costs, like we're doing, and you'll get a better answer. I don't know if we can show it to you, right? Here's, here's the blue answer. So that's so we're seeing that we get the right, right level. Now, if you do turbulence models, there are fancier turbulence models than k-epsilon. So this is the seemingly depressing part. If you use something called a, a Reynolds stress model, if you know what the flow structure is like and it's got effects of curvature, you can certainly recover with RAND. So uh, after the fact, you can, can get back the green line. So that's good. And I'm like, well, then why are you making me do all this stuff for you if you knew me, you could do the answer? Well, the reason is because they don't want to study that geometry. They want to study this geometry, and they don't know how to set up turbulence models for this problem. So it's the more complex environment of all the vortices all over the place, but what do they do without knowing the answer on how you tune your turbulence models? You need a higher fidelity simulation, perhaps not to run everything, but if it guided your turbulence models, that would then inform the lower fidelity tools and they'd be more robust in that sense. So that's the, the ethos, if you like, behind how you might envisage their use. Since then, this is some work of Felipe, uh, who just finished last year with, with uh, Gustavo and myself. He, he was also part of our joint PhD program. We've gone back and we rerun this uh, imperial front wing geometry. Uh, uh, and he's done some nice comparisons, which, well, if you're interested, I can leave you from this paper down below. Actually, we had a wind tunnel that was refurbished by the sympathy. Uh, it wasn't set up that well before the time we had to do the experiment. So the experiments are not very good at the moment because they, they were, uh, everything was all over the place. I've been teasing them recently and they might redo the experiments for us so we can get some better visualizations. You can see here increasing the polynomial of three to five, you kind of get the localized structure and resolution and the separation point that comes out. If you squint your eyes, you can find it on this image. Philippe has also gone back and done some stuff with uh, the army body, which is a very classic geometry. If you do automotive stuff, everyone studied the army body. 
we can show some improvements in terms of the cortex correlations. This actually does pretty well in the Rands models. They, they can tune the Rands models pretty well. And um, so an extension of his work was to see if he could add a, a, a rear diffuser to this problem. Uh, and when you have diffusers, this is a, a slanted part of the back of the body, you can increase the downforce depending on how aggressive you make that, that diffuser geometry. Sorry to go through a bit quickly since we've got not so much time as just two examples. This is um, the, 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 the one that came up in that science, uh, science project. We worked with a guy from McLaren who was the mixed whale nemesis at the time called Mark Taylor. And we worked with this uh, um, company called Elemental. They had a road legal track car. And this was their first design. They couldn't afford to do any wind tunnel experiments. He, we did some rounds, and therefore we, we did some of our simulation to see if we could <coughs> correlate with the rounds and get some confidence about that. And from that, he did three designs. Actually, he tweaked the geometry a bit. There's something, there's a, a roll bar here at the back that he changed the shape up. He introduced something called a gurney flap, which is when you're in the rear of the body, he puts a, a, a plate which is more or less 90 degrees and it increases downforce, it also increases drag. And then in the underbody, it has these diffusers that, that, that go in front. And in the second design, we can demonstrate that you expect to get 33% more downforce. And so they, they did a main the car with that sort of stuff. Then he did a souped up one that was never built. So uh, from his Formula One experience, you can have this diffuser on the back and completely change the underfloor design. Um, because he was pretty experienced at this, he managed to get three times the amount of downforce in terms of those sort of modifications. So just to show you, if you work for 10 years in Formula One, maybe you'll know how to design a road car that has a bit aerodynamic performance. So that's pretty much it. So is it all working? No, this is an example from uh, McLaren, their, their P14, uh, the automotive side we've been working with. Um, what's one of the challenges here? We can, we can mesh the geometry, and these are simulations in comparison to RANDs. One of the challenges is we can't currently afford to, to, res to resolve turbulent boundary lens. So sometimes our inflows are too laminar, too smooth. So in this case, this is a, a profile from this line here. Because our boundary layer is initially laminar, it separates. Uh, and now, so, so this is interesting. Finally, I'm not the biggest fan of turbulence models or anything else, but it kind of brings to light that uh, a wall function, which would be wall models in the S, would be really good here because I know this flow would be turbulent in this region at the front of the car. It's noisy, it hits some geometry, there's no way it would be laminar. So I would like this to be more representative of the turbulent boundary layer and then turn on our technology. And then that would allow us at least to get these initial diffusers not to separate and not to have this disparity. So the RADs are doing much better here because we, we've not managed to apply all the physics will be resolved enough. So that's the kind of challenge that we need to address to move forward. So, okay, I made up some of the time, maybe not all the time. Where are we at? So we're applying these advanced uh, uh, spectral HB element techniques. And because of this, this, this fellowship, which goes to the industrial flow, so it's forced me to look at meshing and the stabilization. Um, and so why is it useful? It's useful for unsteady high fidelity flow modeling for high-end engineering. The point I've been making for a few groups here is, okay, McLaren know what they're doing and they know what the limitations are and they want more so we can help them and Rolls Royce are in a similar situation. If you don't know the answer to your problem, and it's you can have big variations, then the tools you've got to hand on your laptop or using RANDs are probably sufficient for what you need. And what does it take to make it work? Well, uh, okay, so you need to evolve understanding how to most effectively apply the modeling. Meshing has gone from being to be tortured to painful to a specialist skill. It's kind of a process here, but there's no way you press a button and it makes a mesh. It's not really true of lower order, lower order methods either, but it's no better for us. And robustness, okay, so I hope I've given you the idea that by reasonably careful analysis of 1D problems, the stuff we teach at undergraduate level, we've actually learned a lot about what could be the problems in our big 3D problems, and when we've applied it, we found that to be true. So that's quite, quite heartening for me that it goes through a full cycle, that quite simplified analysis has, has led us a long way. But as we've seen with this gradient jump penalization versus SVB, there's still room for improvement. There's different things we can try that we might be able to optimize these these simulations for. So I guess I should say thank you. Royal Academy of Engineering funded me that, that, that fellowship in McLaren and, and EPSRC is our national funding agency, so I shouldn't forget them. Okay, thank you for your attention. So the session is open for questions. I, 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 I,
you watch so why does that happen why does uh the interface between the floor of the car and the asphalt is not uh, well represented in the CFD models and why can't they improve it so they're using that so finding an average flow time average flow they're not signing an uncertain flow. But had, had they, well, they're now using more of the detached data simulation. In principle, that might have caught it. But that as part of this physics, they haven't got all the physics in the CFD simulation, so they can't capture it that way. That would be the limitation of the CFD. So I, I met Ross Braun recently, because he came and he got an honorary degree in Imperial. And then he was talking to me how amused he was about this porpoising, because when his heyday, when they used to do it, they also used to suffer from this. And his comment, I don't know if this is true or not, is they haven't made things stiff enough. They also, you know, we, we use lighter materials, they've got fibers, and it's more flexible. And that's also allowed, you know, if it was a more rigid geometry, potentially it wouldn't have happened too. So he was very amused to see it come back again. <laughs> and I guess just last week, Mercedes have done a redesign. I wonder if they just made their car stiffen to, to overcome that. But yeah, CFD, it didn't have their physics in, so there's no way you'd capture it. So further questions? Uh, regarding the, the problem with, with the turbulence in the water layer that you mentioned, uh, have you tried to play with the uh, free, sweep, free sweep turbulence to see if that would be sorted out? Or? So it's the problem that we've made our simulations too quiet that we couldn't get the right data, and we then we put free stream turbulence in and managed to compensate it for that. We couldn't afford to add that level of scales to the oncoming flow. That's the problem in the big car ones. We can barely afford to resolve what I'm showing you. So putting a noise in and then having to have the mesh that, that, that propagated that noise yeah, is just, just not enough yeah. resolution. So, so that's why in the medium or short term, putting in a wall function of some sort might, might just kind of get a bit better correlation and then make the tool more useful. But eventually, eventually, yeah, you should go back and do that. And as we kind of discussed yesterday, what are the scales in the free stream flow that actually gets into the boundary layer that matters will be useful to know to better guide them. More questions? Yeah, so uh, I have you on. Uh, so you bring it three critical points that uh, the smoothing, the, uh, the meshing, and also the specificity. So which one you think that is more critical in the sense of that you need it to pay attention? Either for the methodological or for the yeah. challenge point of view. It's sort of a correlation to making a mesh because you, you just can't do anything. So that, so 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 in some sense that was the earliest need, and we have a painful way of doing it. So I suppose we can part that for a bit. So the stabilization has probably come up. So 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 the, the other two topics are almost lumped together. They're just different types of stabilization. So one's more mathematical. So um, that's kind of well. I, so, so making this gradient jump penalization would be my priority at the moment because that seems the best hope for having that balance. The, the one thing I missed on there is speed of the solvers. It's another area. So, so that's the topic I didn't talk about today. Preconditions for these system and acceleration is then going to make the tool faster and make it more useful. So in a way, there's a to not answer your question, there's another element of just speeding things up and making the, the more yeah, more speed, bigger turnover more interest in the problem. I think that's really where our efforts are now focused. Shit. Yeah, in the chat we have one question here. So can you comment on the computational setup and use it some stuff possibly? Yeah. So it's hard to come up with exactly. Um, so in the car ones we did those elemental cars, what we often do now is do a precursor simulation that's around and use that as an initial condition. If we don't do that, it takes a long time for it to establish even the kind of basic flow. So we could so 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 we first need the low fidelity simulation in that. The simulations that we did for the uh, um, elemental car, we're probably running on something like four thousand up number of cores, and pretty much we could do a couple of car lengths in a week. That's the sort of time and effort it takes to, to get that through. Yeah. So, so I don't, don't know. I mean, that, that car simulation in Rand could have run on a laptop. So, <laughs> so is that uh, 
Yeah. Okay. Uh, most of the work on, on uh, tire dynamics that we see uh, involving simulation, they always look into like straight line steady speed. Okay. Uh, have you ever used uh, the same tools for like accelerating or braking yeah. or at curves? Uh, no, but they should. I mean, yeah, I yeah, sure. can't say, well, can't say that when he set this, he was the one that kind of funded the fellowship. He used to set as a grand challenge, he had a nice uh, image of a car cornering. Because there are two things. There's one, you decelerate with the car, ride height changes, and then it comes back out and goes back up again. So there's also a, you know, and yeah, you know, in principle, that's simulatable, and that's where they may get to. They lose a lot of time in corners, and they, they do a bit of yaw to try and model it for the but. but so this is where the tail flop rule frustrates me. If we can use anything in the paper, we're probably going to do some of that these days, but that industry can't yet. Yeah. Uh, and the same one of his question, uh, is it possible to simulate uh, cross flows? I mean, like you have obviously the flow of the car because it's, it's going really fast, but few cars have uh, a lot of problem with uh, si uh, sideway Side flows. Yeah. So can you simulate that or is yeah. it not possible yet? It's certainly possible. I mean, a lot of the car simulations I showed you, there were half cars to make it cheaper. So you, you generally need the full cars. It's double the, the, the requirements for this crossing the domain. That's, if you have a big enough computer, you can do it. That's not the, yeah. So it's not impossible. And you get the level of resolution I've shown here. Um, it's a willingness to do it and uh, a willingness to pay for it, which is probably the problem. I mean, mesh, um, IO, I didn't mention this, does become another problem, right? You, when you're running on the laptop and you get away with murder and then you make a simulation that's you know millions of elements and degrees of freedom then you certainly find io is a data processing another headache okay okay then since uh...